Good afternoon, my name is Stephanie Schuyler and I'm a Marion County Hearings Officer. We have one land use case today, floodplain development greenway permit case number 20-003. Please sign in and provide your mailing address if you plan to testify or if you would like a copy of the decision. I'll go over the order of procedure first and then we can begin. I'll go over the nature of the case and why we're here today. I'll Um, then I'll ask for preliminary objections by the parties. I'll summarize the material in the case file. Then the planning division will present its report. The applicant will present evidence and argument and testimony. Then any testimony in favor of applicant's position. Then the appellant will present evidence, argument, and testimony. Then any other testimony in favor of appellant's position. Then we'll do any general comments, neither for or against the application. Then um, that we'll have rebuttal by applicant who has the final burden of proof in this matter. Um, due to the nature of the case, and I've already had a couple requests to leave the record open, we'll address it again at the end, but I will plan to leave the record open um, also because I know some people are watching by CCTV and we have a couple people calling in as well. No decision will be made at the hearing. My decision will be in writing. A copy of the decision will be sent to applicant, interested parties, affected government agencies, and anyone else who requests a copy. Appeal of my decision of the decision may, may be made to the Marion County Board of Commissioners. I am recording the hearing today. Testimony is taken from the tables up front or over the phone and will be under oath or affirmation. The recording will become part of the official record. This hearing is being televised on CCTV, but the televised recording will not become part of the official record. The record in this case is a public record. Any documents submitted become part of the record and generally cannot be returned. If you have any documents you'd like to submit in the record, please let the other party take a look and give them to me, and then I'll mark them as exhibits and make them part of the official record. Um, failure of an issue to be raised in a hearing in person or by letter, or failure to provide statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude an appeal based on that issue and may preclude it from being raised at a later time. Failure of an applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. For condition of approval to apply, it must be stated with sufficient specificity to enable the applicant to respond to the condition prior to the close of the final local hearing. I have had no ex parte communication in this matter, which means I haven't had any of the contact any contact with the parties outside of today's hearing, and I've only seen what's before me in the case file, which I'll go over in a moment. I did do a site visit yesterday out to the site, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about what I saw. Didn't, didn't talk with anybody, just looked at, at the site. So this matter is before the Marion County Hearings Officer on appeal by Scott Putnam, Shalo Put Putnam, Julia Kramer, Patrick Stilwell, Iraj Rafi, and Shaheen Brodel, and I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name, of the planning director's approval of the application of Marion County for a floodway and greenway development permit to install a dock and gangway in the identified 100-year floodplain of the Willamette River at Butteville Landing, uh, River Mile 42.9, in the 20,500 block of Butte Street Northeast, Aurora. So before I summarize the material in the case file, um, I'll ask the parties if there are any preliminary objections to the notice. Um, so this would be any problems you see with the notice, jurisdiction, which is my authority to hear the matter, or con conflict of interest if you believe I have any bias in the matter. Any pre these are just preliminary objections. Anybody? Okay, I see none. Um, so I'll go over now what the, is in the case file. So I have um, the appeal of the planning division decision. Um, I have a copy of the planning division decision. I have the floodway greenway application. Um, I have a submittal by applicant. I just got a paper copy. Um, it's about 150 pages, so I've looked at this briefly, but I just got it yesterday, so I haven't looked at it in depth, but I will. Um, I also have um, a submittal by um, Matthew Martin. 
also lengthy and I haven't had a chance to fully look at this, um, but that's in the file as well. I have documents submitted by John Rasmussen at Public Works, including a memorandum of understanding between Marion County and Friends of Historic Butteville, um, a work and right of way permit, an application for a tree and brush removal from 2017. I have um, the modified lower landscape plan. Um, I have a mem memorandum to the hearings officer from the planning division regarding the status of Butte Street right of way. And this is from May 18th, 2020. I have a memo from Boatwright Engineering regarding this application. I have a memo from Marine, or excuse me, a letter from Marine Structures Engineering. Um, I have a plat map of uh, St. Alexi. I also have a survey of the area. Um, and a, a close-up of the survey. Um, I have a couple more copies of the same memorandum of understanding between Marion County and the Friends. Um, I've received comments from Kevin Klupinger, Michael Denton, Randy Harris, Julie Harris, Stephen Shade, Julie Kramer. Um, I have a position of, in support of the appeal by Donald, signed by Donald and Marilyn Schmidt. And I have, I did receive requests to leave the record open um, from Rob Beasley and Elizabeth Holmes. I have a memorandum from Public Works with engineering requirements and advisory. Um, and then I have comments back, no comments from code enforcement, uh, building inspection, tax office, um, and the building plans examiner. And I have um, floodplain, aerial maps, um, as well as a, a site plan, another aerial a zoning map, the notification map, and then um, the cert certification of mailing for the notification. So, oh, excuse me, I have one more thing. Um, I also received this binder, uh, that I believe and this is on behalf of appellants, but I have not had a chance to look at this, but it is in the record. Okay. Okay, so all testimonies should be directed to the subject matter of the case. The laws and provisions applicable to this case are found in Marion County Code 17-110-680, Chapter 17178 and Chapter 17179. And if you believe there are any additional criteria that apply, you can tell me during your testimony. Any other procedural questions before we begin? And do you mind? Yeah, thank you. So I'll have a list of. So just for the record, you're asking, you have a drive for a PowerPoint that's in here? No, I don't, I, we don't have a, the ability, the technology to include that in the record, unfortunately, but if, if there's photos or anything from it that you want to submit during the open record, that's okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'll have um, planning staff please begin. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. For the record, Brandon Reich, R-E-I-C-H. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you gave in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Thank you. Um, the subject property, so I will, sub I will summarize the uh, staff report. There are copies available on the table over there uh, if people would like a copy. The subject property constitutes an existing right-of-way and is designated rural residential and correspondingly zoned acres residential. <clears throat> the portion of the property within the Willamette River is in the floodway of the river. Portions of the property outside the river are in the 500-year floodplain of the Willamette River. The property is also within the Willamette River Greenway. Surrounding properties in all directions are zoned acres residential and developed with dwellings. Property to the northeast is zoned CC community commercial and owned by Oregon State Parks. The applicant is proposing to construct a gangway and dock in the Willamette River. Marion County flood insurance rate map indicates that the development site is within the floodway of the Willamette River. The um, conditions of approval um, include item number eight, 
um, where the requirement is to record a, a sign and record a declaratory statement um, that the um, property is within the floodplain if it were developed. Additional conditions are listed in items 9 and 10 of, of the staff report. Um, planning determined that the, um, the floodplain portion could be conditioned to be approved um, as provided by the applicant. The greenway conditions are listed in item number 12 of the staff report and the review of those were included there. Based on the findings, it was determined that the proposal complied or was able to be conditioned to comply with all the criteria in the Marion County Code for development of the floodplain greenway and the land use planning director approved the request subject to conditions. With that, I'm available for any questions you may have. Okay. I do have one question. Um, I'm sure I'll probably have some more. But I see, so the, the application was signed by Benjamin Williams. And I, I guess I'm wondering his authority to sign the application. I know I have a, memor a memorandum of understanding with the city, or excuse me, with the county. Um, but it doesn't look like he's an agent of the county. Is that something you can address? Mm -hmm. um, the Friends of Historic Butteville are the applicants making the application on, on right away that the county regulates. Um, the county would be able to sign that application if it's necessary as the property owner since we have the authority to manage the, the right of way in that area. Okay. I think um, since the record's going to be left open, as I've mentioned, that probably that's something we want to include as well because I, I don't have any, any sort of signature from the county in there. Okay. Thank um, you. I do have one question for you, too, while you're here. It looks like MCC 178.060A through G. Are those specific to just structures? And I didn't see that I was looking in through the definitions in this section that any structures are being proposed here. Um, they are for structures and docks are included. Any kind of man-made development would be included as a structure. And even the definition of development includes fill, anything that isn't natural on the property. Okay, because I saw the development, it seemed like it would definitely be development, but I thought the structure just included a walled and roofed building, specifically in that section. I just want to make sure, as I'm addressing the criteria, that I'm clear on that. So I'm in 178060, or actually I think the definitions are in the beginning of that section. I'm looking at, uh, it's under KK structure. Say again where you see structure, KK? Mm -hmm. I can share mine with you too. You You're old, welcome to, I know you have a big binder there. I have an old version. That's okay, I'll just read it for the, so structure means for floodplain management purposes, a walled and roofed building, including a gas or liquid storage tank that is principally above ground as well as a manufactured dwelling. So is there any of that proposed here? No, none of that there. Okay, just but I make there, sure I'm clear. There is development, There's development. development under the definition of the FEMA requirements. Right. Okay, just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so now we'll have um, the applicant come up or applicant's representative and um, present evidence, testimony, and argument. And, and please feel free to sit. And you'll, you'll probably have to because the mic won't pick you up unless you're pretty close. So please go ahead and state your name and spell your last name for the record. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Holmes. I spell Elizabeth with an S. My last name is Holmes, Joel and Yes. I'm an attorney with Blue River Law, UD, and I represent the Friends of Historic Beautiful today. 
Okay. And I'm going to ask you to pull the mic a little bit closer. It's, I know it's awkward for everyone, but if, if you can't hear yourself, um, it won't pick it up. Yeah. So, um, so I, I know you're representing in representative capacity, but in case you are giving any testimony, do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Okay, go ahead. issues of ownership and the rights attendant to ownership. Um, that is the primary issue that the appellants are contesting and without their success on those issues um, they don't succeed on any of their other challenges to the substance of the floodplain or greenway applications themselves. The property is a public road right-of-way um, as you have in the documents um, it, the 1871 plat map shows Butte Avenue as a public road um, and the state cultural report which we have provided as Exhibit 7 also documents that this was uh, platted back in the 1840s. Um, an avenue is, you know, by definition, um, a passageway to be um, uh, a way of access that is to be bordered by trees. Um, the way that it was um, it's referred to in the appellant's documents that were just filed uh, this morning or last night um, try and emphasize that this is a street but even still a street is something that um, is a thoroughfare that has dedicated sidewalk areas. Under um, the, the plat maps there's nothing that suggests that the sole use of this or any use of it is supposed to be commercial. There's no specific dedication uh, for a kind of use other than it's a public road right of way for public use to access the Willamette River. Um, the other thing I'll note is that under Marion County Code 17110.425, the definition of owner is that it can be any other legal interest. So if a owner owns a fee or if an owner has an easement, either of those under the Marion County Code gives the, um, um, the owner of the easement or the road right of way the right to, um, to certain rights attendant to that ownership. As easements are intended to be perpetual in duration, there's nothing here to suggest that um, any prior uses of this as a way to access the river have been changed. Um, with respect to the rights attendant to ownership, within the Oregon Revised Statute and the um, Marion County Code, the focus of the restoration work that the county and the Friends of Historic Butteville have been undertaking for three years is fully within their rights. Um, the structures that are allowed to be um, provided on this property um, specifically provide for passage and for use of the area as a right of way. Um, the definition of a public road in ORS 368.001 subsection 5 means that the public has a right of use over the road. Um, and ORS 368.001 section 6 defines a road as being the entire right of way for ingress and egress for any kind of means of, of, of transportation um, that provides travel between places. And by definition, the, um, the ways that a road can be, um, that are provided for in the statute is to, again, to facilitate passage. So for example, culverts, tunnels, similar structures, structures that provide for the continuity of a right of way, such as bridges. Again, all of these facilitate passage, which is exactly what the, the project here is doing. 
Also under the Marion County Code, Chapter 11, Section 15, which is entitled Improvements for Public Rights of Way, the focus is on public health, safety, and welfare protection um, and maintaining uh, locations for public interest and public use. And that chapter also provides the Marion County Commissioners with broad authority to prescribe methods and the manners of working uh, and improving and repaving access within these public rights of way. Um, so um, some of the history here is that there has been uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Friends of Historic Beautiful and the county um, to try and reach a solution for how to address this property. It had become um, overgrown and the um, county um, reached an agreement with some of the property owners to have them remove the encroachments that the local property owners were allowing uh, to occur on this property, which essentially choked the area with overgrowth, effectively deterring the public from accessing what is a public way. Um, so in 2017, the Friends of Historic Butteville engaged the public, conducted fundraising, which has continued to date, and has proposed and implemented a plan for restoration. Um, the holder of an easement is fully allowed to conduct these kinds of activities of restoration and maintenance and improvement. Um, with respect to the purposes and the criteria of the floodplain overlay zone and the greenway zone, um, all of the criteria are satisfied. Um, we've submitted, um, I have citations to each of the criteria that are already in the original application uh, for both of those, as well as for um, additional exhibits that have been provided. Um, the thing I'd like to initially note that for purposes of the floodplain overlay zone, um, the engineers that have reviewed the project uh, have noticed that really it's just a minuscule flood risk change from the, pro from the property as it was prior to the project, and that's Exhibit 14, pages 7 and 8. Um, for the standards for the flood protection zone, um, a lot of the decision issued um, said that conditional approval was provided um, based on um, additional information to be provided, and that has been um, provided as part of the exhibits um, uh, provided. <laughs> so um, most of this relates to, like, for the non-residential um, structure uh, requirements, for the anchoring requirements, the construction materials and methods, the utility issue, storage of materials um, and equipment, that's primarily in the application, pages 17, pages 18, pages 21 and 22 um, discuss those issues predominantly. Um, I will just say too, with respect to the purposes of the floodplain overlay zone, again, one of the primary purposes um, is to address health, safety and property. And exhibit seven that we provided, the state cultural office report, um, really describes how the um, old cement dock that's been there for a long, long time has been actively collapsing um, with uh, large bolts um, protruding 15 or 16 inches. And there's photographs in exhibit seven that really demonstrate um, the, the, essentially the danger that this old dock provided uh, to people that tried to use the area. Um, let's see. The other point then moving on to the um, purpose of the Greenway criteria, um, again, is to preserve the natural and scenic recreational qualities of the Willamette River. And um, part of the main goal of this project is to, to, to make it safe for public use and public um, facility to access the river. Um, for the Greenway criteria, uh, primarily um, Exhibits 12 and Exhibit 17, uh, Exhibit 11, Exhibit 15, uh, 6 and 9 um, are the ones that we focus on. Uh, to address the issues such as the significant fish and wildlife habitat protection. Um, this is a critical habitat area for salmonids, and so there was a lot of um, additional um, 
uh, requirements that the Friends of Historic Beatville and the county had to satisfy before being able to do any work. Um, the, uh, there's been some issues about the kind of landscaping that was done. Um, it's all, um, it would involve the removal of invasive species um, and using native plants. Um, this is, um, as you'll note, there's a large historical context for this area that the appellants were actually quite involved in, in terms of establishing and uh, providing signage. And uh, one of the reasons why the old cement dock is being maintained um, is um, at the request of the appellants. So in order to make the project safe, there were certain other precautions that had to be taken. Um, I do just want to note that um, one of the issues that has come up is that this is intended to be an ingress and egress for primarily non-motorsports to the Willamette River. And I know in the final decision, um, there was reference to this being a park. This is not a park. Um, this is a way to access the river. Um, the, or the right of way itself is, is um, allowed to be used in the entirety. And as I mentioned before, when it was granted as an avenue, um, there was an implication that that involved um, some greenery there. Um, I, I could, if you want, go through all of the, all of the specific criteria for each of the floodplain um, overlay zone aspects or the greenway criteria. Um, but I also want to be respectful of, of my time. And, um, and uh, since we, I would like to ask, again, that we um, have the record remain open. I can provide more detail on each of those um, um, in writing. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you have to go through all of them. Okay. If you want to, you certainly can. But um, I do have it in writing. So, um, I have a couple questions. Let's mm -hmm. see. Do you know? Um, it looks like so. I saw there's a permit, and this may be a question for staff as well. But in from 2017 for removal of trees and brush, I believe it. When I went out there, it looks like the sidewalk is pretty new, or this, I guess I should say, concrete path. Is that, was that allowed outright because it's in a right of way, or was a permit needed for that, or did that come about at the same time? I was just curious of the history of that. I would have to confer with my client on the exact process as to how that was. Do you happen to know when, when that, that concrete path went in, or if it was, what process was involved with that, if any? I don't, Madam Hearings Officer. There's a copy of the um, permit over there I was going to look at. We can also contact st um, staff on the phone, too, to ask that question. Okay. Maybe um, we'll, we'll wait, I think. and I, I know in that permit I didn't see it, but I was curious. Um, so in, as part of the improvements, it, it, it looks like there's the pathway, some signage, also um, picnic benches and... Um, Benches for seating, is that, it's was my, that part of the project too? Excuse me, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's my understanding that that's primarily for staging purposes. Okay. Um, so for example, to remove your remove your kayak, set it down, um, get set up before getting down to the dockway um, mm -hmm. so that there isn't a congestion on the dock. Okay. And I know, I saw in the memorandum of understanding, it's kind of a, a joint, um, not a joint venture, but a a collaboration in terms of maintenance. I, I saw some trash cans when I was out there. Is that who, who collects that trash? Is that collected regularly? Is it part of I'll have county to, pickup? Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> I, and I, I'm not expecting you to know off the top of your head, but these were just some of my questions while yeah, I was out I, there. Again, I'll have to um, confirm the exact details of that with with my client. Okay. Um, and another question, this is probably for them as well, and maybe I can ask um, when some others testify, but what's, is there a regular schedule that the Friends of Butteville are out there or Historic Butteville are out there doing maintenance or cleanup or how, I guess, what's the process of caring for this landing? So I, that's just, that's my question for the record and yeah. that either maybe we can, it can be addressed during the open record period. Yeah, I can okay. provide additional information on that. That'd be great. So okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Madam Hearings Officer? Yes. So I do have clarification. I found the correct code online um, about the, uh, the flood development standards. So C1, if, if, I, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, C1 uh, involves either elevating or dry flood proofing a structure. 
And Wait, in this I'm case, sorry, just to interrupt you. C1 of... Um, um, sorry, sorry. 17178060 C1 okay. involves either elevating or dry flood proofing a structure. And I included that in here in case it ended up some component needed a building permit that would be uh, became a structure needed a building permit had a cover or some kind of an anchoring or something required that on the on the land portion this would be the requirements that would apply to that that structure okay the um, then 060 d1 just refers to new construction and substantial improvements and construction is a form of development on the property and um, development is defined it doesn't include construction specifically but it's to indicate that it's something that you do actively to the property mm -hmm. and e1 and 2 both are new construction and substantial improvements they don't necessarily they can be involved for if you're building uh, fill or you're building a dam mm -hmm. or a, a damming with, with soil or anything like that would, would, would come into play okay all right thank you for the clarification thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so next we'll have testimony um, specifically in favor of the application. Um, so I have, looks like um, Ben Williams. Are you planning to testify? Good afternoon, can you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Okay. My name is Ben Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, um, 23013 Erie Lane in Aurora 97002. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I'm president of Friends of Historic Butteville. We also operate the Butteville store um, on behalf of Shampoo State Park. If you were there for a site visit yesterday, you will know that the um, historic beautiful store is two short blocks away from the landing, um, one block away from the, the county parking at the top of the landing. Um, so we are a heritage and history organization and one of the concerns um, that the county had back in 2015 and 2016 was the practical reality that this is a um, dedicated public right-of-way. It's therefore not funded in the county road system and it's not a county park so it's therefore not funded in the county park budget. So it kind of has a limbo status like many other right-of-ways um, but one that's very historic and um, as our council pointed out has some inherent hazards given that it was um, not maintained because there was no budget to do so and uh, it has the old historic footings, which are, if you've looked at the photograph, you could, it's self-evident what the hazards associated with those are. Um, so motivated off the history and heritage, um, we entered into the MOU, Memo of Understanding with the county to, um, to restore the landing. Um, the operating frame of reference being that it was a right of way. So the trail was put in the way it was and designed as such to be a roadway specifically reinforced concrete that would handle an ambulance so that should there be a need, a vehicle could get down to the level of ordinary high water. Um, so and as an- Was that in 2017? That was the, um, that was the concrete went in in 2018, okay. I believe. Okay. And the 2017 work was removing the invasive species, mm -hmm. doing basic um, grade and fill to fill the um, what was very bad erosion in in two places and put in boulder walls to stabilize the um, the bottom of the landing and stop uh, sedimentary erosion into the river etc cetera, etc cetera. so in the course of that we found the old roadbed and the trail went in on the old roadbed in 2018 mm -hmm. designed to be a road um, and that was a, one of the requirements from the county the the overarching and uh, constant mantra was it's a right of way what's done in there has to be as a road because it's not a park mm -hmm. um, so the the whole purpose here has been to restore public right of way um, as was stated previously or public access across the right of way um, the ultimate goal being in tandem with historic use and the county sign at the top of the landing describes it as the historic Butteville riverboat landing and then goes on to say public access must be maintained. Um, so it was to provide public access to the river and the purpose of the dock and gangway is safe access to the river itself. Um, and the small dock by design 
would be for small power craft, but an emphasis on paddle craft, canoe and, uh, and, and kayak craft. Um, so the, the, the goal here has been that, um, and I think it's worth say, stating that um, this is one of the very few places in that section of the Willamette River known as the Newburg Pool that offers no charge public access to the river. Um, that, that can be contentious um, when understood by some parties, but it, it's important given that this is uh, a right of way owned and, um, and controlled by the county that county citizens have access to the river. Um, to that end, I'll just add, that means it's a community asset. And it has been a community asset since the first settlers arrived and the right of way was created. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the ongoing problem has been the, uh, the preference on the part of adjacent property owners to have it be and treated as a private asset rather than as a public asset. Okay. And this actually might be a better question for you. So how, I know the friends are involved some in maintenance and What's, what's the process for maintaining this landing in terms of plants, trash, just overall? Trash is picked up once a week on Monday morning, which is when uh, North Marion uh, okay, garbage so and recycling picks route. up. Okay. Yep. And because we're, um, we oper also operate the store mm -hmm. for the park, and the park has regular weekly trash pickup, it's take the liners out of the garbage cans at the top of the landing, take them to the dumpster at the beautiful store a block away, okay. and that happens weekly. And what about plants, weeds, all of that? Um, so the re-landscaping happened in the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. All the plants that you saw in there, I should say 98% because we're still fighting berries, as everyone in Oregon does, um, are native species that were replanted as part of the landscape plan to replace the invasive species, which had uh, taken over the landing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's two components to answering your question. Um, we have a, within Friends of Historic Butteville a maintenance committee as a volunteer, mm -hmm. and that is um, weekly mowing of the grass and weeding as necessary. But then the adjustment to the second part becomes um, adjusting to the variable of the weather. Mm -hmm. So an example would be this spring, where for about six weeks we alternated between intense rain and then a week of warm weather and intense rain and a week of warm weather. At the outset of which we had uh, overseeded bare spots and fertilized the grass. And so we went about two and a half, maybe three weeks without mowing because of that. Uh, the combination of all the moisture and the overseeding. Um, so that was, that's an example of the adjustment. And the weeding is as necessary as well. Okay, okay. thank you. I don't think I have thank any you. other questions. Thank you. Um, so now we'll have appellants or appellants representative come up. So Good afternoon, my name is Bill Kabeisman, K-A-B-E-I-S-E-M-A-N, and I'm an attorney at Bateman Seidel, 888 uh, Southwest, 9, uh, Southwest Broadway in Portland, 97204. Um, um, okay, and do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm here representing the appellants uh, today, and we're asking you to reverse the planning uh, director's decision as it was inconsistent with the criteria in, in code and uh, state law. I do want to quickly note that you will you did receive some material submitted uh, from council. We've had a change in council, okay. and so um, that material is still submitted on, on our behalf, but as a result of that change, we also are asking for a continuance or that the record be left open. I think we'd prefer a continuance, um, but uh, I understand you have that right. So, um, and were we going to call you on the phone? Did you? No. No, that was... Oh, that, that I okay. did put I did put that down. Oh, that's okay. I, I just apologize. Wanna, okay, yes. I, your name sounded familiar. So yeah. Um, well, for now, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It'll be easier not to have a phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. 
So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You're requesting a continuance or leave the record record open? Yes. Okay, so um, I think for now, if, if you're prepared, we'll continue, and then at, at the end we can decide if Great. what, what no, needs I'm, to take and place. I am prepared today, but you know, okay. there's a lot of information and history to, to absorb with this. Okay. I do want to make a quick question of, of staff, and um, at the beginning of this you indicated uh, that the staff report was available on the table over there. I went over and there wasn't anything labeled a staff report. Was it just a copy of the appeal and the um, It's decision? the appeal followed by the staff report followed by the land use maps. Okay. And I, I wasn't able to find that appeal yep. on the website. Was that available seven days before? Um, the, the, we don't put them on the website necessarily, but they are available by the, in the file. And they were yeah, available? Yeah, at, at any time. And it was available seven days before? Yes different than the information I got on the phone, but that's, um, we'll just move forward. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, we represent the, the appellants and um, there's a number of topic covered in the, the memo that we submitted. I wanna cover some particular ones. And the first one is a primary one that I think you've heard about today and I wanna go into a little further and that's about the ownership of the property and what uh, can be done. Um, I, you, I think perceptively noted that the county had not signed this. The applicant was listed as Bilden Williams and the Friends of Historic Butteville, and they have no ownership interest. The MOU indicates that they're not agents of the county, and there's no other signature. So that, that's a primary problem. The county, uh, I believe it was a planning division, entered a memo indicating that in fact, it qualified, the county can sign it uh, pursuant to 17.119020, Sub D, which says uh, an application may be filed by the appropriate local government or state agency when the application is for a public works project. If you read that memo, they don't call it a public works project, they call it kind of a public works project. This isn't being done by the, the public agency, it's being done by a private, private entity. More importantly, 17.119.025 tells you what the required signatures are, and it says applications shall include the following signatures one, signatures of all owners of the subject property, not a owner, but all owners. So getting the county signature is necessary, but not sufficient. I want to read I you. don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. um, is that a either or provision? Uh, yes, but they don't. Uh, um, I, 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 are you talking about in the yeah. 17.119? Um, 025, yeah. So... Because I, of course, was looking at this as well. So under, um, so I see where you are in number one, signatures mm -hmm. of all owners of the subject property. Under five, the signature of an authorized agent of a public agency or utility holding an easement or other right that entitles the applicant to conduct the proposed use on the subject property without the approval of the property owners. So is it your position that doesn't apply here? Uh, that is, and I'll get into the reasons why okay. that doesn't apply. And, and the okay. main reason is because what they're doing here is creating a park, and that's inconsistent with the, um, with the, the, uh, with the reasons for the dedication. Okay. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, what I'll turn to next is, this property, uh, the right of way was dedicated to the to the count to the public pursuant to a uh, plat that was created in the 1800s, and there's a variety of case law that's cited in the memo that explains uh, the um, you know what that dedication entails, and I'll also point out on the Marion County website that talks about public right of way, and I did not submit a copy of it, but I will do that during the either the contingents or the record. I, I believe I may have a copy. Okay, all right, basically stating that uh, county's right of way is in the form of a right, road right of way easement. An easement is a limited right to go on and make use of another's property for a specific purpose. And so what they are doing here, and I believe I heard Mr. Williams even refer to the area as the park, that you know some of the trash is collected from the park every week. Um, if you look at the decision of the uh, planning director, there's a variety of references to this as a park. I, I think this is a pretty straightforward case of if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And to the, to the extent they're trying to say, oh no, it's just a, a roadway, that's all it is, is an access. That's just not the way it's gonna function. 
The concrete walkway has bollards in the front of it. There are picnic tables, as you've noticed, that this is an area for recreational, act, recreational uh, activities. It's not a roadway or other access that is appropriate in a road right of way. Um, and with that, I want to turn to the criteria for the floodplain. Generally, we're going to rely on what's in, in the uh, memorandum. I understand there's a number of engineering reports that were submitted today. We haven't had a chance to review those. They may change some, something, but I heard the attorney for the applicant say that any rise would be minuscule. Unfortunately, this is in the floodway. This is an area that is heavily regulated, and any rise, no matter how minuscule, is prohibited in the floodway. And to the extent they don't have a certification showing that there is no rise in the floodway, it's, it's prohibited. Finally, I want to talk about the Greenway permit. And I think there's some significant issues there that my clients are going to speak to. And in particular, 17.179050 requires compliance with the criteria in, in that section. And first one is that uh, subsection I, the proposed development change or intensification of use is compatible with existing uses on the site and surrounding area. That's not addressed in the planning de uh, decision at all. And it's hard to look at what's happening here and not acknowledge that there is an intensification of use here. I believe the applicant themselves have said this really wasn't accessible and now it's going to be accessible. So there is an intensification use, and they've got to explain how it is compatible with the existing uses on the site and the surrounding area. In addition, subsection L says, any public recreational use or facility shall not substantially interfere with established uses on adjoining properties. And again, they uh, have not addressed that. Uh, M, maintenance of public safety and protection of the public and private property, especially from vandalism and trespass, shall be provided to the maximum extent practical. Again, they haven't addressed it, and they haven't really dealt with it. I think you, uh, I, I believe you were somewhat concerned with that with your questions about trash uh, pickup, and that is a concern of the, of the neighbors. They have uh, suffered a variety of different activities down in that area. It's become a magnet uh, for late night um, uh, folks, and I'll let them explain it further. But I don't believe that, they ha that the application has shown that uh, they have protected public and private property from, uh, from those impacts at all. And so because they haven't complied with the greenway permits, they haven't shown compliance with the floodplain permits, and they don't have the authority to do what they're doing down there, we think the only result from this must be a denial of the application. Okay. Thank you. So I apologize. I have I have a list of um, those signed up either to testify or get a copy of the decision. I should have asked um, after Mr. Williams went if anybody else is here to testify in support of the application. Okay, I didn't. I thought you were all on this list, but um, so I, I think I'll just run down the list, and then um, if you don't necessarily want to testify, you just wanted a copy of the decision. That's fine. You definitely don't have to. Um, so Julie Kramer. Okay, go ahead and come on up. So once you get settled, I'll have you state your name and spell your last name for the record. And for everyone, I'm going to keep asking you to get pretty close to the mic. Okay. Good afternoon. My name's Julie Kramer. Is this close enough? Yeah, that's okay. good. And my home is the historic 1890 William Riley Shire House. Okay, hold on one moment. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony? Sorry. That's okay. That the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Okay, go ahead. My home is the historic 1890 William Riley Shire House adjacent to the Butteville Landing on the south side. Captain Shire was my great-great-grandfather and he was a successful grain merchant who shipped corn, grain, and hops from the home by steamship on the Willamette River. I was extremely thrilled to be able to repurchase the home back into our family in 1999. I'm appealing permit case number 20003 for many reasons, but I will focus on just a few of the primary issues and conditions of the permit requirements which the applicant cannot comply with. 
Number one, Marion County cannot establish ownership of Butte Street. County records show that Butte Street, extending from First Street all the way down to the Willamette River, is a right-of-way roadway easement granted by French-Canadian settler Alexis Aubuchon in 1871. Mr. Aubuchon built the home currently owned by my neighbors, Scott and Shay Putnam, whose home is adjacent to the Butteville Landing on the north side. Per Marion County's own definition of a right-of-way, quote, by granting a public right-of-way, the owner is giving an easement across their land for specific uses, but retains ownership of the land, end quote. While it is stated throughout the applicant's documents that Marion County is the owner of Butte Street, there are no records showing they actually own it. There are statements made by the chairman of the Marion County Parks Commission, Ben Williams, during its official meeting on 5-23-2017 that directly conflict with the county and Mr. Williams' current claim that Marion County owns Butte Street. I would like to read direct quotes from those minutes at this time. Quote, Ben provided an update on Butteville Landing. He said Marion County's final position is that the right-of-way is an easement. Ben said the title is held by the neighbors with the county having easement, which has a reversionary clause that it must remain a roadway and can't be given away. He said BOC, which I believe means Board of Commissioners, is fully supporting establishing Butteville Landing, but wants it funded as by the community and or a nonprofit. Ben said this is not what everyone wanted to hear, but it is a big improvement from where they were last year. He said tonight they will also kick off fundraising, but certain grants are off the table now, end quote. Um, and if I can, I'd like to submit those, a copy of those minutes. Sure. Um, do I? I first, yeah, let him take a look. Sure, and they're on, um, the quote is on page three. And the quote is on page three for the record. So once he's done taking a look, that will be exhibit one. Sure. Right. Please note that these statements were made by Mr. Williams in May 2017, showing that he was well aware there was a title issue regarding the subject property four months before ground was broken on the Butteville Landing Park in October 2017. Chapter 17.179.050.I of the permit requirement states, the proposed development, change, or intensification of use is compatible with existing uses on the site and surrounding area. We found no record of any flood or dock in Butteville in 1980 as described by the applicant, and according to informational signage installed at the landing by the applicant himself, all ferry use at the landing ended in 1908. The original ferry dock in the 1900s was intended for commercial use, either as a means of shipping, grains and produce, or public transportation, because the only other means of transportation in Butteville at that time was either horse and buggy or bicycle. The dock was never intended for recreational purposes. So the applicants claim that his application for a recreational gangway and dock is compatible with a commercial dock that hasn't been in use since the 1900s is a misrepresentation. Additionally, use of the subject location has changed intensely before the applicant was allowed to begin developing it into a park with multiple picnic tables, a bench, informational signage, and a concrete walkway. Before the development of a park, it was a quiet, peaceful, shaded natural dirt trail to the river nestled among tall shade trees, occasionally used as a bass, fish, bass fishing hole by some of the locals. Following the applicant's clear cutting of tall 40 plus year old native Oregon maple trees and his destruction of the natural growth, wildlife habitat, and vegetative fringe in the fall of 2017, it is now unshaded 
and unmaintained with an unattractive concrete sidewalk with unsightly weeds and blackberries and planting of small trees that are now mostly deceased. There is no management, there is no maintenance, and no security because the county has no available funds and the FOHB fails to maintain it also. On the rare occasions the applicant does minimal ma maintenance, which is very rare, unsightly piles of debris are left to decay alongside the, the concrete walkway. Because it's heavily promoted by the applicant, there are visitors arriving at the park an average of every three to four minutes on sunny days, creating parking problems for the community along with blocked access to our driveways from vehicles of visitors. And because the county leaves it open 24 hours a day, it's become known as a nighttime party site by an unwelcome element from outside the local community and Butteville's crime rate has significantly increased as a result. Chapter 17.179.050.L states, any public recreational use or facility shall not substantially interfere with established uses on adjoining property. The public park was improperly installed in a 60-foot wide right-of-way roadway easement because Marion County refuses to acknowledge that they allowed the applicant to create a park. As I mentioned previously, they keep Butteville Landing open 24 hours a day. Because Marion County has no funds for ongoing management, security, or maintenance, and because these services are not provided by the applicant either, the park has substantially interfered with established uses on our adjoining property in the following ways. One, trespassing at all hours. Disruption of our sleep at 2 or 3 a.m. on a regular basis from trespassers and loud visitors at the park, often many nights in a row. Three, theft from trespassers. Four, vandalism. Five, threats and confrontation. Six, loud fights and altercations. Seven, trash and debris from trespassers. Eight, sorry, trash blowing onto our private property from picnickers. Nine, trash dumped from cars parked at the right-of-way roadway easement. Sorry. <laughs> 10, motorcycles, scooters, and golf carts driving down the concrete walkway to the river. 11, skateboarders riding down the concrete walkway and jumping into the river. 12, sorry, I didn't think I was emotional about this, but I guess I am. Okay, take your time. Late night intoxicated partiers jumping into the river from the concrete walkway. 13, loud music blasting and loud engine noise from park visitors 24 hours a day. 14, loss of privacy. 15, IV drug use, open marijuana, and alcohol use in the park at all hours. I apologize. You have to apologize. Motorcycles, scooters, golf carts, and skateboarders riding down the river have been enticed and encouraged by the installation of the concrete walkway that was installed in the right-of-way easement by the applicant. Whereas prior to the installation of the park, there was only a naturally created dirt access trail. Skateboarders and intoxicated individuals jumping off the concrete footings have created an especially dangerous liability to us as adjacent property owners should an injury occur. Although this has been pointed out to the applicant repeatedly, our concerns have been discounted as just idle complaints. We are especially at risk as adjacent property owners due to the fact that Marion County signed a memo of understanding with the applicant's 501c3 nonprofit corporation, the FOHB, basically absolving the county of any responsibility. Since the FOHB could potentially dissolve at any time, this means we as adjacent property owners could be held solely financially responsibility. We have had no trespassing private property signs installed since the development of the park, but they are either ignored 
or found removed and tossed aside by trespassers. We have found it necessary to call the Marion County's Sheriff's Department for help on numerous occasions due to these problems, but it takes an average of 40 minutes to three hours response time due to the large territory the Sheriff's Department is covering. And there are times the Sheriff is not able to respond at all, depending on their call volume. The applicant's proposal to install a dock and gangway located in extremely close proximity between the pre-existing boat docks of the adjoining homeowners will only cause these issues to worsen. Chapter 17179.050.m states, maintenance of public safety and protection of public and private property, especially from vandalism and trespass, shall be provided to the maximum extent practical. The park has also endangered the local community. After noticing an increase in reported crime in our area, we met with our neighbors to determine whether the promotion of the new park by the applicant could be related to the crime increase in the immediate outlying areas of the Butteville Landing. We learned that because word has gotten around about the new park being accessible 24 hours a day with no regular nighttime sheriff patrol available, it has rapidly attracted an unsavory and dangerous element, and this has resulted in a significant increase in theft, trespassing, vandalism, drug use, and other related crimes throughout the outlying Butteville community. We found that a majority of members of the community we spoke with are not in favor of the park and definitely do not want a gangway, dock, or any other amenities added to it. We have included a signed petition from Butteville residents today asking to revise the planning director's decision to approve the gangway and dock. It should be noted that many FOHB board members do not live, as well as the applicant, do not live anywhere near Butteville Landing and thus are not at all affected by the negative changes their actions and decisions have brought about to the Butteville community. Chapter 17179.050.0 states, public access to and along the river be considered in conjunction with subdivision, commercial, and industrial development and public lands acquisitions where appropriate. This access should be located and designed to minimize trespass and other adverse effects on adjoining property. The public access park that was created on the right-of-way easement at Butte Street actually encourage, encourages trespassing onto the adjoining properties. A trail can be seen at the end of a chain-link fence that the applicant refused to lengthen by a few extra feet that leads straight to my property. I regularly find fish, bait, fish hooks, I'm sorry, fish hooks, bait, and other garbage left on my boat dock, which is readily accessible by trespassing on my property from where the chain-link fencing was stopped short at the historic concrete footings by the applicant. The applicant could easily have extended the fence further in order to prevent trespassing as I requested, but he refused to do so. This also places me at financial risk in the event someone is injured on my property. My neighbors, the Putnams, have also regularly experienced trespassing issues onto their private property at all hours of the day and night due to the same inadequate fence issue created by the applicant, who now notifies us that he expects us to pay to add additional fencing. Because, I'm sorry, Mr. Williams, I heard just now claim that his motivation for installing the park is the history and heritage of the era the era. However, we have written proof that his motivation is in fact the desire to have an economic driver for the Butteville General Store that he also acknowledged he is the manager of. Because the applicant cannot meet the criteria required by Marion County for the issuance of a floodplain greenway, greenway permit, we respectfully request that you reverse the decision of the planning director granting FOHB permit the approval of permit number 20-003. Thank you, and I apologize for the amount of time I took here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, um, Susan Ro Roberts, okay. go ahead and come up. And once you get settled, I'll have you state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Susan Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. And do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, as I said, my name is Susan Roberts. I live less than a block from where the parking lot and landing is. I live right across the street on the corner. If you were out there yesterday, we were the big house on the corner. We moved here in 2008 from Southern Oregon. We moved to Butteville as it was a quiet neighborhood, a quiet community, safe for kids, and something we were used to. That's why we chose the area. We had no problems. Access was available to the river. It looked natural. It was beautiful. Access was not denied. There was a cute little path. Um, when um, improvements started happening in 2017, problems began. More people, and you were out there yesterday. There's a sharp cur uh, corner. It can get very congested, and we've had so much traffic out there. Uh, we've had speeding, cars parking everywhere, all over our property, um, making almost sticking out in the road right on the corner. Uh, garbage and noise. The last two years, though, things have really escalated. We've had zombie motorhomes, which I don't know if you're aware of those. They're motorhomes where people live in. They park all over, usually with terrible activity comes along with that. Um, we have dr drunk and disorderly individuals. We have pot smoking. I took my dog for a walk down there last week in the afternoon, people are smoking pot in the middle of the day. Um, IV drug needles were found there. And um, all hours of the day and night, people are wandering around in our neighborhood. In fact, on one occasion, we had a man that had parked over in the parking lot. He wandered over to our house and tried opening our door. Thank goodness it was locked. Um, he was drunk out of his mind. He proceeded to relieve himself on our front lawn and then wander off. I called 911. Nobody was able to respond in time. Um, they called probably three or four hours later at one in the morning to ask me facts of the incident. So safety is a huge issue because we don't have quick response. Um, let's see. Um, we have two children, two girls age 12 and 14. We don't allow them to go down there anymore. It was supposed to be a community asset. It is no longer a community asset. It is now a community problem, very much so. Uh, my husband and neighbors have been responding to all the situations that have been happening down there, and it's concerning. I mean, one of these times when they do respond, I'm fearful something terrible is going to happen. We know we're on the very north edge of Marion County, and we realize it's a long response time. We know that budgets are short, uh, that there's not a lot of patrol officers, but unfortunately, that's where we live, and that's why safety is huge. Um, we had a situation last Tuesday, even over at the Butteville store. I called the sheriff's department. They said, oh, that's not our jurisdiction. They sent me to state police, not their jurisdiction, and then eventually a sheriff called us. They did respond probably within an hour. Um, we had people out there with loud music, offens offensive language. They were very aggressive. We asked them to please leave, and they got very confrontational. And when the officer finally got there, he did say that they felt like this was going to happen because it's just an attractive nuisance. People that are not making good choices hang out in places like this. So I fear for the safety of our children, my husband, the community, and the community having to deal with negative situations in our neighborhood that did not occur prior to the park path, the signage, the so-called parking lot, and then just to think if a dock and gangway is put in, 
it's just going to cause more trouble. It's going to amp up everything that's already happened. It's the desire of the Friends of Historic Butteville to construct and further improve a gangway and dock in our neighborhood. And as Julie previously said, the majority of those board members do not live in our neighborhood. They do not experience what happens on a regular basis. And I'm talking all hours of the day and night. This has turned out to be an attractive nuisance for all the wrong reasons. The proposed dock and gang gangway will draw even more adverse activities and danger to our community. It's already a local party spot. The word has gotten out that we're open 24 seven. Signs were put up and I will give you a copy of that after I'm through here. Um, and not just one sign. If you were out there yesterday, you saw what a small area the parking area was. So not only did one sign get posted, but four. And it was like an open invitation to come on down, stay here 24 hours a day. Um, it didn't protect us. And it was surprising that four signs were put up with that language during a stay home order by our governor. I'm sorry, can you, what, what did the sign say? Oh, the no parking sign? So, yeah, it says no parking, 10, um, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Right, now look underneath, though. That's the sign mm -hmm. I'm referring to. Okay, so for the record, it says notice per ORS chapters 368 and 810. No person shall obstruct or interfere with access by the public within the right-of-way of Butte Street without expressed written permission of Marion County. So I'll, I'll put this in the record as Exhibit 2. Please. So the Butteville store was shut down and there were cones and things in the parking area and yet within two hours of a phone call four signs were put up and as you can see those signs are like inviting people to our park um, it's just a matter of time before somebody is seriously injured that dock is too close to neighboring docks access to the Willamette River is available two miles west of Shampooey there's French Prairie it's a no-fee park. It's only two miles away. The traffic this has suddenly created <clears throat> is an issue, and not even to mention more traffic. Where are canoe trailers, and where are more people going to park? It's a total safety issue, especially with, with our kids right on the corner. Um, I don't understand how this could be approved when the conditions and restrictions have not been met. With all this said, Historic Butteville has been preserved. There is public access to, to the Willamette River at no cost in other areas just two miles down the road. And the problems did start in 2017. They got worse. The placing of a gangway and dock will increase drugs, drinking, crime, parking, and traffic to our neighborhood. Public safety is a huge issue. Please reverse the decision for the dock and the gangway and let me make sure I've addressed everything Up again. again it's not a community asset I heard someone mention it was staging for canoes and paddle boats it's not staging it's a park it's park benches it's a bench people have been coming there using it as a park a park is a park is a park and just making sure I've covered everything. It does not provide for public health and safety. In fact, it encourages public problems and it does not cover public health and safety. It's causing trouble. It's turned in, it, it is a recreational area in the middle of a community, of a neighborhood. I think that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, um, next on my list I have Patrick Stillwell, if you plan to testify. And once you get up, I'll have you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please. Patrick Stillwell, S-T-I-L-W-E-L-L. -L. And do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Okay, go ahead. So I, I live at uh, 23707 First Street, which borders the park. And uh, 
And I am going to pull you a little closer to the mic. Oh, okay. You, it actually, you can actually pull it closer so it's more comfortable, too. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about just a, a couple of items that are in the application, the requirements. And I'm going to quote what the requirement is and see why I think it's they're failing okay. at meeting it. Uh, the first one is um, the requirement says maintenance of public safety, protection of public and private property, especially from vandalism and trespass, shall be provided to the maximum extent practical. And, you know, other people have been talking about that, so I'm just going to share my personal experience. Um, the events to date have demonstrated utter failure in meeting this requirement. There's been late night intrusions, littering, drinking, drugs, trespassing, all this with disturbingly increasing frequency. Um, however, this comes as no surprise to any of us because we knew it was coming. From the onset of the park development project, it's been clear that no realistic consideration was being given to the security issues resulting from you know, this development. Uh, this, this park clearing and access has created an unpoliced 24-7 open access to the riverfront in the middle of this small uh, residential community. Uh, the Friends of Butteville has, in my opinion, blindly focused solely on, on their intended uses for this park, ignoring all the other repercussions. Uh, and the reality has been that the residents bordering the park have experienced a plague of problem activities, uh, as everybody here has been testifying to. And as a result, the residents bordering the park have, we've been forced into taking on the role of being the local police force. And we're the ones that have to go down in the middle of the night when we're waiting for the sheriff to confront whatever, you know, is going on down here uh, at all hours. And as uh, other folks have said, the uh, response times for the sheriff, they're very unpredictable. Sometimes they can't make it at all. Um, and just, I knew this was gonna happen. And we originally went to a couple of the Friends of uh, Historic Butteville meetings before any of the construction or demolition was, took place. And we expressed these concerns. And the response that we got was that uh, we should just call somebody from Friends of Historic Butteville, you know, like they were going to come handle it, which I just thought was laughable. Um, like that was the plan. I was like, what kind of plan is that? Um, anyway, that's my comment on that first it item. Uh, the uh, other requirement um, from the application that I'm gonna say something about is, is uh, in quote, any public recreational use or facility shall not substantially interfere with the established uses on adjoining property. Well, one of the things um, that this park has created is, is uh, Butte Street is, is basically privately maintained access to our properties. And it's basically been turned into a parking lot for the store and for this park which means that there's all this wear and tear that's occurring uh, that we are responsible for. And uh, I don't think um, there's been any, any, anything um, to address that. All right, I had a couple other things that, that uh, just from, responding to comments that other people said. Um, so there's no dock yet, but on any nice day, this park is populated with all kinds of people. Families, they're all coming down there, they're hanging out, they're picnicking, they're hanging out down by the river. Um, I don't know how you can't call this a park, you know. It's a park. Uh, and the. I don't really understand how uh, the creation of the park is going to make this problem with the footings safer because when we're down on our dock, 
we see kids coming down there and they love to go out and hang out on those footings and dare each other to see how, you know, show each other how cocky and brave they are. Um, I don't know how they're gonna keep people from doing that. There's gonna be more people down, down there doing that. Uh, and, you know, kids are gonna, they're gonna find a way to get out there even if they try and block it off. So I don't see how this park is making it any safer. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, next on my list, I have Sc Scott Putnam. And so once you're settled, please uh, state your name and spell your last name for the record. Thank you. Scott Putnam, P-U-T-N-A-M. And do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, appreciate your time um, hearing, hearing this out. So I'm going to be pretty direct and short. Um, I think you've heard a lot of details about what us, us and the neighbors have experienced. Um, we are on the north north hand side of the um, Beatville Landing, um, aka Park, um, not, a, not a public access. Long story short is we want our property back, we want our rights back. We moved out there nine years ago with our twin boys. They're gonna turn 11 years old here on Monday. I fear for them. Um, I'm, I'm scared to send them to the mailbox as they saw intravenous drug use the other day, right in the parking lot, not even in the park where the needles were dumped into the garbage can. I beg the difference that those garbage cans are even picked up on a weekly basis. Um, constantly traffic down that park, middle of the night, all hours of the night. Let's face it, nothing good after midnight is happening down there and it's every night for the most part constantly trespassing into our property as the fence does not reach far enough we've got a nice beach that's always got glass from broken bottles constantly kicking kids adults we have video of people talking about how they swim out our, to our dock at night to hang out i don't get camera service down there i bought cameras and i put them all over our property um, i do not let the, about the boys go down to swim alone any longer. I don't allow them to go down to the dock and fish alone any longer. It has intruded on our life over the last two to three years more than we could ever imagine. That friend is the friends, whatever they want to call themselves, are not friends of us. They never came to our door. They never knocked on our door. They never told us what their plans and long-term plans were. They kept us out of it and they kept us out of it for a reason. They didn't want, they knew that we'd object this. We get the brunt of it. They don't. You know, I think there's one or two people on the board that live in the vicinity and everybody else is out of sight, out of mind. They don't, they don't touch it, they don't hear it, they don't deal with it. They hear us and they think we're just a bunch of complainers. But the, the proof of the matter is we've got a problem. Bad people are coming to that place. It is not an easement, it's a park. We want it back. People can still use it like it used to be. It looks like a downtown park. It doesn't even look, I, I would have to beg to differ that. The friends and the historic folks, if they have looked back and rolled over in their graves to see what that park looks like today. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Putnam? I don't want to mispronounce your name. Is it Shalo? Okay, Shalo Putnam. So please also state your name and spell your last name for the record. Okay, um, my name is Shalo Putnam. Um, S-H-A-L-O-E and Putnam, P-U-T-N-A-M. Thank you. And do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I oh, do. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't know I was being called up next. So, no. That's okay. Take your time. Okay. So I just want to firstly say that um, I am support of everything that... Uh, all the other people that are putting the appeal in have just mentioned. So I'm going to try to not reiterate what everybody else said, but just add additional comments because I've experienced obviously everything that they have experienced and it's been rough. So, okay. so I do understand that today's hearing is about the criteria and meeting the criteria for the dock and gangway in that notice of decision. My husband and I, Scott, moved to Butteville in 2011. We were trying to leave the big city problems. We lived in Portland, and we want our kids were really young, so we came out to Butteville to raise them in a peaceful, quiet community. Um, like Julie said, that that trail that was existing there was beautiful, 
maple trees, it was shaded, it was beautiful, and like um, Sue and Steve had said, people utilized it, and we never discouraged people from going down there and fishing and swimming, and it was utilized by local community, and we didn't have issues, and we always felt safe to let our kids go out there, and it was great. The thing that I'm gonna share is that around 2015, Butteville store um, was searching for someone to run the concessions. Um, so my husband and I were considering it and we actually met with, at that time, because it's owned by the Oregon State, with Oregon Parks, and at that time it was Friends of Shampooey. So just to know, my understanding is that Friends of Shampooey has d dissolved. So we just decided not to pursue it for various reasons. Um, but then, I think like a year later to a couple years, maybe I don't remember the exact dates, but Friends of Historic Butteville formed. They took over the concessions for the store. And at that point, I think they were forming the board members. They actually invited me to the meet a meeting. At that meeting, they were interested because if you came, there's new construction at that park, uh, the White House. Mm -hmm. My parents are building it next to us, um, and that used to be vacant. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they were interested in is because they were aware, with Friends of Historic Butteville, obviously their overall goal is with concessions is to increase traffic and increase revenue for the store. And uh, parking, they knew, was going to be an issue because right in front of the store, it's very limited parking. When they have their big Saturday night events with music outside or any of their fundraisers, bring, parking is a huge issue. So they asked if they could use our vacant lot for parking because they knew it was going to be an issue. So we kind of looked at that. And at first, I think people did use it, even without our asking. And it, it just, it was, it got out of hand. It got out of control. So we knew that we were going to build on it. So we didn't go any further with that being a parking lot. Um, so after that happened, I, we, weren't, we really weren't invited back. So Friends of Historic Butteville was planning to do this park. And I think they had mentioned notification, because we're the adjoining property members. And as Ben stated in his minutes, that we are the fee title owner of the property. And it's to remain a roadway. Being the adjoining property members, you would think that if they truly are friends of Butteville, that they would care what we thought and how it was going to impact us in planning. So I want to share, um, there is an email um, that states, um, that states, well, first I want, I want to address what the, so let me go, okay. So this is what they said about us. So the meeting, they mentioned, I think Mr. Ben Williams had mentioned that they invited us and invited us to attend. Mm -hmm. But in this email, it says, I'm sending all of you this info, and this was from Ben to the board members, because Shay is a dues-paying member and wants to attend the November 13th board meeting, and Julie will be with her. I don't want the meeting derailed. So we will all need to have some understanding of what's behind their position. And what was behind my position is my fears and concerns. So we addressed and we approached Ben and said, look, this is in 2017. This is, I, he said, Shay and Julie are all over this as the vehicle that will strip them of their private property rights and negatively impact their property values. Invite the homeless. She said they will walk down there from Charbonneau, encourage drug uses, she said this will just be like spring water quarter, and they envision all kinds of restraints, like kayak lanes, limited access to their dock, et cetera. And so they didn't want the meeting to be derailed by our concerns. Um, he says, I'm suggesting we have an agenda, public comment item right after the approval of minutes, and invite them to have their say and ask questions, and then invite them to leave. OK. Um, the other thing is, is uh, again, this just kind of reiterates how we really weren't notified the way we should have been notified, and I feel like we were intentionally left off for various reasons. But at the, that last comment, he says, by the way, I've taken um, somebody off, who, and I don't want to mention his name because he's not here, but off the par public parks, off this email string. 
I may be paranoid, but I'm concerned the opponents of the landing could obtain our correspondence via public records. If you agree, let them know we will give meeting notices and agendas, but they will be update them orally. Okay, so, um, so the goal was really, and I feel like the goal was they knew that they were going to turn this into a park and that it was negatively going to impact the adjoining property members, and I think that's maybe why they didn't want us to be in attendance to derail things. Um, they had the knowledge that Butte Street was a road easement and a, a road right away and not a park, um, but they still put in all the applications that um, it was owned by Marion County, but in his own minutes it stated that it is owned by us. Um, okay, so again, going back to the parking, because of the very limited parking, especially for their weekly dinners, they have turned that local access road. And this is what's very conflicting and hard for under, us to understand. So they mentioned that in 1871, Butte Street was dedicated on a plat as a public right-of-way. But that's all of Butte Street. So if you look in front of the street and it comes down and then it goes down to the park. And on, that, on the survey, it shows it's just a street all the way down to the river. So how can it be a county road in front of the store, a parking lot on our local access road, Bullard's, to clearly a park? It's just not consistent with the whole Butte, Butte Avenue. Um, so that creates, and then they, they have no, they have not done anything to address any of the parking issues at all. Um, so, so everything post-2017, again, including removal of all those old trees, because if we are fee title owners, I feel like we should have gotten notification that they were going to remove their trees just based on Marion County's own definition of what a public right-of-way is and who owns it and what they're supposed to do with those trees. But we, were, we did not receive any notification, and they just took the trees away, and it was done. And we don't, I don't understand how that really happened. Um, over and over and over again, for t this has been three years now, um, we have tried to reach out to Ben and the and the Butteville, Friends of Historic Butteville, and really share our concerns um, to let them know that these things are happening and it really has fallen on deaf ears. They do not hear us. They, they actually make fun of us in the emails. <laughs> um, and, and so, like my husband said, we are Butteville. They are not friends of us. They do not care about how it's affecting us as the joining property members, and it shows that they tried to actually derail us from being at those meetings and attend and get notification. Um, so I wonder, what is this? What is the motivation? What truly is the motiva motivation of Friends of Historic Butteville for putting this in? They mentioned safety at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I can say that with the concrete pathway that's coming down if you saw yesterday it's a concrete pathway that comes down and like Julie says continuously there's people that come from Shampooy Park on bicycles there's no notification that it ends right there abruptly little kids come down there on their bicycles skateboarders come down it is so much more unsafe than it ever was you never ever saw that prior to that but now it's just people aren't aware of what's at the bottom of it Maybe they think that there's something there, but they'll drive. And then on top of it, there's people, the kids that do it intentionally for fun and to throw dares and stuff. So it is not safe. It has not become safer, at, if at all. And I don't want to forget this part. So we're talking about summer months right now. Um, I think in the exhibits uh, that the uh, Matthew Martin attached, there's pictures of what the river looks like in the winter. And... In one of the pictures, it shows the wintry debris. Mm -hmm. That river in the winter is very scary. I don't know how they're going to address safety concerns for the river in the winter. For whatever reason, the Willamette River curves at that point. Logs, big, big, big trees and logs, and you can see in that picture, come and hit the dock. Mm -hmm. And if people are coming down there and unaware of that with kids, it is, it is not safe. It is not safe at all. I will not let my kids go down there in the winter at all. Um, and we get nervous to even, you know, we had to have a tugboat come up and remove all the wintry debris at, at, an, at a hefty cost. So who will 
cover that if uh, Marion County isn't funding it. And again, if Friends of Shampooey dissolved and Friends of Historic Butteville, there's a few members, if they dissolve, then what? So that's a big concern. So I'm almost done. Um, I, I would say when it comes to, you know, one of the criteria, back to the criteria of change in use and intensification, the park has been a significant change of use and intensification. It is so much more unsafe for visitors and neighbors. It, um, and you can see in those pictures. This property is a right-of-way, and according to Ben Minutes, there's a reversionary clause that it's to remain a roadway and a right-of-way, and that means that when they turn it into a park, you know, does it revert back to us to keep it safe? Because we will, as friends of Historic Butteville, keep it safe for the visitors. Um, and so that is my end, and I really appreciate you taking the time. It's, um, it's been a long three years, and it's put a big toll on us, and I think we're all very emotional about it, but we appreciate you listening. So, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, I also um, have Steve Roberts. Go ahead and state your name and spell your last name for the record. Okay, Steve Roberts, R-O-B-E-R-T-S. Okay, and if you want, the mics are pretty adjustable if it's too low for you. How's um, it working? What's, it's good. Let's hang with um, it. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you give in this proceeding will be true to the best of your knowledge? I certainly do. Okay, and I will have you pull it a little bit closer. Okay. A little bit. It's not quite getting you. All right. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to start out by saying that um, uh, I, I do sit on the board of Friends of Historic Butteville, and in the original planning for this trail, um, I was on board with it. Um, I supported the, and voted in favor of the project. Uh, my hopes were that it would enhance the local access to the river uh, that flows approximately 300 feet from my house. I actually saw you come over and park from my very front door, okay? Um, I would also like to state that everyone on the Friends of Historic Board in, originally had the very best of intentions for Butteville, um, but it morphed, and it morphed drastically. Um, now, uh, over two years into the project, I can no longer support any part of what has taken place uh, and what is to forecast it for the future, and I especially uh, oppose any kind of a gangway or a dock. Okay? I think it's going to put our neighborhood totally in peril if, you do, if that takes place. Um, my reasons are escalation of crime, trespass, and disrespect for personal property has degraded this once quiet and peaceful neighborhood into an area of uh, continuous concern for our safety and security. I'm going to repeat some of the things that have already been said, but they need to be repeated because they really need to be heard. When I've uh, uh, attempted to have these conversations with the representative friends of Historic Butteville, I basically got lip service, so I want to make sure they hear it today. My concerns, drug and alcohol use, needles and other drug paraphernalia discarded on the, uh, and along the trail. As my wife stated, we're raising our two grandchildren. They're no longer allowed to go down there. It used to be a place of, where we went down to crawl down on Julie's property and go fishing. <laughs> um, trespassing on around adjacent properties at all hours. I get up at night and do a perimeter check. I'm a Vietnam vet and I like to know I'm safe in my little hut where I live there. And it's not unusual for me to go around and flick on the lights and I have them set up all the way around my house and I could do this so I can go back to sleep. At, uh, it was like 1.13 in the morning or 2.13, it was a 13. The other morning when I woke up, there was a person walking by in my front door. What are people doing out there at 1.13 or 2.13 in the morning? I suppose they're not up to real, real good. The people during the day are pretty innocuous, not a problem. But the people walking around at night, I have a problem with that. Um, law enforcement lack of patrolling, one to three hour response times if they respond at all. The other night, as we said, we had an altercation across it almost went physical. And 45 minutes, which was almost a record, mind you, we had a patrol officer out there. When the gentleman come over and tried to literally break into, hands on, shoving on our door, 
as big as my door, trying to get in with my wife standing behind it and my grandchildren upstairs looking down. Um, when that happened, they called us four hours later. These happened at 9 o'clock because I had just tucked my grandchildren in. And at 1 o'clock in the morning, we get a phone call wanting details. Now, this guy was able to get back in his car over there, parked right where you did, by the way. And he went down the road. After he fumbled around, he was so drunk that he couldn't even walk down the slight incline of our yard and wind, wound up uh, relieving himself in his trousers right there in front of my wife. And then on down to his pickup, got in his pickup. I escorted him over there, hoping that maybe I could get the, the keys from him to... Uh, eliminate the danger to others if he got back on the road. But I was, but I wasn't going to, you know, by myself take on this guy that made two of me. And he got on the road, couldn't even he he weaved going out of the parking lot and turned and wound up, who knows where. But four hours later, we get a phone call wanting information on this. Okay, so not only endangerment of Butteville, but because of that situation, everybody within wherever he went, okay? Um, a real problem is lack of defined ju jurisdiction. As my wife stated, police, the state police don't want anything to do with it. And they told her to call, um, uh, to call the sheriff's department, or well, actually to call OPRD. We called OPRD, got an answering service. We have now a phone number that's supposedly a direct line to OPRD. Now. If we'd have got a hold of OPRD. Was our OPRD? Oregon Parks and Recreation. Okay. At Shampooey, which is two miles upstream from us. Okay. Okay, which owns the store. OPOD, you understand that OPOD owns the store. Right. There, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have no jurisdiction. So basically that's a dead end for us. Then also, uh, so we did finally get a sheriff. So. Uh, that's that's really a concern. And during the altercation that took place the other night, a lot could have happened in that 45 minutes. Like I said, it very closely went physical. It didn't happen, but it came close. Um, so something else that uh, really got to me, um, immediately follow, following uh, Kate Brown's order to shut down Oregon, the park... OPRD, Shampooey was closed. The store, the parking area, was closed. I understand it was a $1,250 fine for parking in the parking area just adjacent to where you parked yesterday. Mm -hmm. The little park two miles up the road uh, to the north of us was closed with a bar gate across it. The boat ramp was closed. Do you realize we were the only place in Oregon that was really open? Seriously. We got signs out there that you have a picture of right there. It says we're open from 10 o'clock, that you can park there from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. Do you know of a park that you can park till 10 a.m.? Aren't most parks in the state of Oregon, the city and everything else from dawn to dusk? But no, we're open till 10 a.m. Worse, we go down and we look at this sign the right there. 10 p.m., right? Not 10 p.m., yeah. Yeah, yeah, 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., mm -hmm. to clarify. But if you will take a look at that sign down there, I saw you reading it, and it basically states that we don't even have the horsepower to walk down there and ask somebody to leave because we can't, as the citizens that are on each side of that property, we cannot go down there. It says, uh, no person shall obstruct or interfere with accessibility of, by the public within the right of way of Butteville Street. First, we really need to ascertain what is that property. To me, it's almost, from everything I've heard around, it's no man's land. I'm not sure we really know what it is, and I think that needs to be figured out. The other thing is, that basically stipulates, it's like putting a Statue of Liberty out in the middle of that parking lot saying, bring us your sick, lame, and lazy. Because it says that anybody can come there, and they can stay there as long as they want, and we don't have the right to throw them away, but oh my gosh, if we call a cop, we might be there two or three hours waiting for one to help us out with a situation to throw them out of there. We got a problem. There's seriously a problem there. And again, when we talked to 
FOHB, we get lip service. And I am part of FOHB. So what I'm going to do from this point forward, I'm going to, you know, uh, ask my, my uh, members at Friends of Historic Butteville to withdraw the uh, application for the permit to start with. I'm going to ask Ben Williams and, and appeal to his heartstrings to make that go away. Um, because it's going to really cause a mess. Somebody's going to really get hurt on the on on the uh, existing structure that's down there, and it's not going to take long. Because the other day I was down there, walked a cute, watched a cute young lady walk out to the end of. I hope you saw that standing structure, concrete down there. Mm -hmm. Walked out to the end, did a cute little period, come back. Now, if she'd have taken a header off that. That would have been our first opportunity to drive an emergency vehicle down that walk because you're not going to do that and survive without without massive injuries so we have that to look forward to and my question kind of is you know because we can't establish right now it's, it's like a gray area if somebody did get hurt there where's that liability going to transfer i'll bet you marion county would say oh that's not ours at this point, they'd be running like crazy away from that. But yet it would, would come back on the two property owners. Did they fall on this side of the easement or that side of the easement? Is it, is it Shays or is it Julie's? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that really need to be examined here before we go further with this. Um, let me make sure I got it all. Because I got a bunch. Okay. Um, Again, we covered the signs and the public notice. I need to tell you that those signs went up after uh, Julie Kramer made a call to uh, Public Works asking them what we could do to mitigate, mitigate the parking situation during the shutdown, right after the Oregon shutdown. That's what I'm referring to. The signs, both signs, the no parking and the one below? No, the no parking up, were, that was were there. those are, I believe those came from uh, FOHB. Okay, the notice signs came up way later, like months okay. later, I don't know. That happened, it was almost like in retribution for some of the situations that they'd been having. They've been having a contest back and forth for a couple of years now. These signs show up like that, and it was, to me, when I walked over there and looked at that, it was like a stab in the heart. My God, I've been putting my life at risk going out here trying to mitigate some of these situations, and then... This sign shows up, and it was just like saying, thanks a lot, Steve. We're going to make it easier for you here. So we're going to make it easier for you to get hurt, basically. So I, I really took offense to that sign, and I still do. Um, I would like to say that, the, the you know, let, let's, let's let common sense dictate this meeting, and that is if we already have an attractive nuisance, that's causing a problem, what do you think that a gangway and a dock is gonna create? We're gonna really have a problem. And, and, and another thing is, when you actually look at the location of where that dock and gangway is gonna come into, it's within 10 feet. I'm gonna estimate 10, maybe 20 feet, in some pictures it looks like it's gonna be almost five feet away from um, Scott and Shay's dock. Now you look down that river on the south side of the river going, traveling in that area, most of the docks are 300 feet apart. This isn't like Lake Oswego where they're just on the well, see, that's in my way. <laughs> so it's not like Lake Oswego. This is, you know, open country. People have space. We have acreage, not square footage. So I, I would call that really into question. It's, it's actually, it would be, it's ridiculous, to be honest with you. Um, and you know, again, when we, or when, when the county, I guess that's me, because I pay taxes here. When the county sent out notices for this hearing, I've been told that by the county that they sent out notices within 300 feet of that landing. That doesn't seem reasonable in a rural area to me at all. 
Now, I'm just questioning that because it doesn't seem reasonable to me. Maybe it seems reasonable to the county. I can throw a rock 300 feet. And I guarantee you that a rock can affect you at 300 feet. So don't you think that there should be some a little bit more outreach to take a sampling of the immediate community not just a sample of the immediate property owners because everyone in Butteville is affected by this and I'll tell you when we did get the word out that there was a lot more people involved in this you have an example of that with I think all the submissions of the signatures that Butteville is not behind this um, let's see all right you're probably tired of me now I think I got it Thank you very much for Thank hearing you. us, though. Okay. Did, um, did we miss anybody? Anybody else like to testify before um, applicants rebuttal? Okay. Uh, I may have just already testified, but I realized I forgot to submit the petition that uh, Mr. Roberts just mentioned. Okay. Hand that to, uh, okay, so you're submitting um, the petition that he was just referencing? Yes. Okay. So um, we'll enter that in the exhibit, or excuse me, into the record as exhibit three. So now is the opportunity for rebuttal by applicant. And you're still sworn in that lasts the whole time. Thank you. Uh, if I may, because there's a lot of pretty specific factual issues that were addressed, I'm just going to do something very short and then I'd like to ask Mr. Williams to um, continue the rebuttal for just a few minutes to respond to some of the points that were raised That's fine. Um, that relate to the application. Um, I just wanted to also say that I similarly did not receive a copy of the staff report and I had tried to obtain it um, before the hearing as well and it wasn't on the website. So I would... Um, I, like I do know that. I, know, I don't think they're on the website. Right. Do you want to... I just want to uh, point out there is no staff report for this hearing. There's only the planning director's decision. Nothing additional is, pre is prepared by staff. Okay. I guess I'm a little confused because I expected a staff report and then I believe um, uh, you had asked for a staff report as well. So um, if there's one available that's not on the website, there, it will there, be forthcoming. There was not one prepared, there will not be one. There is a planning director's decision that was the final decision until it was appealed. There's no additional work by staff prepared for a report. Next will be the hearings officer's decision. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to, to mention that as I stated before, the Marion County Code has broad authority for the kind of work that can be done, um, including um, specifically addressing paving. I'm sorry, um, can you pull the mic closer? I'm you sorry. guys are gonna make me work hard <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> on the playback on this. <laughs> um, and I provided the citation for that Earlier, it's under Chapter 11.15 for improvement. Um, I also wanted to cite regarding the flood change levels. I think it's 0 0.02 cubic feet, um, and that's Exhibit 15 that we submitted, page 7. Uh, on the greenway factors, um, accessibility had been uh, limited because it's the appellants that had, in fact, let it grow over. Um, uh, which was contrary to a 2009 agreement that they had with the county regarding accessibility. Um, this area, as you know, is in the Newburgh Pool. This is a very popular area with lots of um, docks and lots of activity uh, for the public for using the river and using the area. Um, also, this project is consistent, particularly with Goals 15 um, and Goal 12. Um, and then with respect to the, uh, the comments regarding increased criminal activity, I did note that in the materials we received this morning uh, that it really only appears that there's uh, any kind of police reports that have been filed since the final decision was issued. There's been nothing provided before that time. Um, and I believe that other um, issues on that point uh, my client will address. I do just want to note again too though that this is um, that you know 
this area is a very popular area, speaking about the Newburgh pool generally, um, with a lot of, um, a lot of people. So, um, you know, some of the questions about whether or not this relates to um, the landscaping changes that have been done, um, you know, this, this area is very popular. Some of the issues that have been raised might not be directly related to um, the efforts that Friends of Historic Beautiful has been making to, this, making to this particular property. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Williams, do you want to come back up? Certainly, thank you. I will take the opportunity to address four specific points that were made out of the many so that we don't spend all afternoon and evening here. Um, the first is we're certainly not going to um, deny that there's been in, an increase in use um, and knowledge about the restoration of the landing um, has driven an increase in use. Um, I will qualify that by saying though that based on what we know from uh, board members and other members that live in Butteville as well in the, as the surrounding area that the dramatic increase in use associated with a whole bunch of let's call it suboptimal or criminal behavior has principally taken case uh, occurred in the last three months. Uh, the last three months uh, we've been in a pandemic situation which is hopefully a once in a lifetime maybe once ever event and yes um, it's unfortunate that at the time that um, Governor Brown closed state parks and uh, Marion County closed county parks and a cl if closure after closure happened um, the Butteville Landing because of its status as a right-of-way was not closed uh, that, that that's unfortunate um, someone I think it was Shay uh, Putnam said that um, they were in direct contract contact with Public Works in fact uh, if they were it was secondary the initial contact made with Public Works was made by me on behalf of Friends of Historic Butteville outlining exactly that what is going to happen given that um, county parks have closed and uh, state parks have closed and um, the message back was that it's a right-of-way and under ordinance uh, ORS whatever the number is um, the public dedicated right-of-way has to be kept open um, it, that decision right or wrong it will have to be taken up with public works I had nothing to do with it I communicated that to the adjacent property owners and they then took it on themselves what, what we discussed signage put up by the property owners to try and uh, reduce usage, but the context was responding to the pandemic, which would be social distancing, wearing masks, not congregating, things of that nature, right? Um, and I told them I fully supported them doing that. Uh, what uh, resulted, though, was signage that said the landing was closed. From who put that signage up? the adjacent property okay. owners. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is that that specifically is was what resulted in the signs, the four signs being added at the landing that were just copies of which were just given to you. Um, in 2017, the county put in additional dedicated marked parking in the upper area of the Butteville Landing. Um, so it should be noted that in 2009, Julie Kramer and her then husband and Robin Brandt, uh, from whom the Putnams bought their property, had to enter into a settlement with, agreement with Marion County because they had been encroaching on the right-of-way, essentially planting in the right-of-way to make it all appear to be a private driveway. And they got into all the Kramers, got into altercations with the then owner of the vacant lot. The point being that they had to uh, withdraw all of that encroachment. Not all of it was withdrawn, most of it was. Um, but the county beyond that did nothing in terms of adding parking. There's a strip of pavement down the center that you would have noticed when you were there, and it's a gravel shoulder on either side. So in 2017, the county came in and put in dedicated parking, um, nose-in parking on the, uh, on the downriver side, parallel parking on the upriver side, within their rights because it's a public right-of-way. At that time, the county, not Friends of Historic Butteville, put up the red on white signs that say no parking 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Those are county signs created by the county sign shop and installed by the county sign shop. 
along at this as well as the other um, signage on the property that indicates what is private and what is public property and the no trespassing signs mm -hmm. um, but it was after the adjacent property owners put their own handmade closure signs up at the landing at the top where the bollards are and by the way the bollards are not permanent the center bollard is removable creating a 10-foot wide access for a vehicle to go down the roadway um, they're not permanent I don't so you don't um, have t take that impression away um, but it was in response to that that the county put up the sign about access only uh, being denied with express written permission um, you'll have to take up with public works uh, what the logic behind that was but we had nothing to do with either and in fact tried to intervene with the county to raise the question of what we are going to do. Significantly given the, uh, the allegations that have been made and the assertions that have been made is I pointed out in the email communication with Shea Putnam and with Julie that a decision to close the landing, quote unquote, could not be made by Friends of Historic Butteville because we do not own a landing. That would be a property owner decision. And the, op the assumption we've been operating under, which is described in the memo of understanding, it, easement or right of way, is that the property ownership, the operational ownership, is held by the county. So it's a, I said to them, it's a county decision. It's not a decision Friends of Historic Butteville can make. Yet they made the decision to put up their own closure signs. And I believe that's what triggered the, the second set of signs being installed. Um, a couple of other comments just to clarify how easy it is to emphasize certain things at the expense of others. Um, two people mentioned that there's access to the Willamette River, easy access implied to the Willamette River only two miles away at, the, at French Prairie. Well, what's being talked about there is a little adjunct to Shampooey State Park called the French Prairie Access, which is less than five acres barely maintained. There's a road to a little parking area and a 30-foot bank to the river. There is no access to the Willamette River there unless you want to uh, get into rock climbing. And it's overgrown and dangerous. Um, relative to the assertions about Friends of Historic Butteville and our board meetings, etc., we're an Oregon nonprofit corporation and board meetings are private. They're not public meetings. We have an annual community meeting, an annual meeting which is public, which we can, uh, position as a community meeting because it covers a small portion of nonprofit corporation business, but the majority of the meeting is about the rest of our work. Um, and for the very first one of those, we not only sent an email to everyone on our email list, but we printed and delivered handbills to every residence, every address, street address in Butteville. And Julie Kramer and Pat Stowell and Shay Putnam and Robin Brandt, who was then the property owner of what the property now owned by the Putnams, were all at that meeting, just as they were at the subsequent um, community meeting held a year, the following year, I think it was earlier in the year. Um, but I want to clarify that board meetings are not public. Shay asked to be present to express her concerns, and I told her we'd adjust our schedule accordingly, adjust the agenda accordingly, and we did. Thank you. Okay. Thank do you have you. any questions for me while I'm here? I, I don't think I do. No. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anything further from staff? No, there is not. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've already had a request to leave the record open. Um, I don't, since we've heard all the testimony, I don't see a need to continue the hearing, but um, I am going to leave the record open. Um, I think in this case it makes sense to do a 777, which would be seven days uh, for participants, any participants to submit additional written testimony, argument, and evidence seven days to for participants to respond to anything new that's been submitted, and then another seven days to give applicant the final rebuttal. So that would be um, seven days, so June 18th. I wrote these down, but I always want to double check the dates. June 25th? Yep, okay, so June 25th would be the first seven day period. July 2nd um, is a chance to respond to anything new that's submitted, and July 9th, would be applicant's final rebuttal. Yes. Um, if I may, I actually am taking my first vacation for three years that week. If there's any chance with the 7-9 date to continue the following week, if, um, 
Is there any objection to that? Okay. 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 So we'll. Um, so the first um, open record for anyone to submit additional any additional information is till July second, um, fourteen days from now. Till July 9th will be to respond to new uh, material submitted, and then July sixteenth will be applicants' final rebuttal. Um, and so to submit, everything would be submitted to the planning planning department by 5 p.m. of the dates that I've given. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and close this hearing. Again, after the end of the open record period, I'll issue a written decision, and everyone who signed up will get a copy of that decision. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for your testimony. Appreciate it.